Okay, so now, uh, why is this evaluation of, of probabilistic polynomial a good idea? So why ca can we do something here that is, uh, that is going to be, uh, to be more efficient? And the thing is that we split the computation in two parts. First, we are going to compute the polynomial Q formally. Um, okay, we are going to compute this polynomial Q formally. And once we have done that, we are just going to do exhaustive search on the remaining n minus t variable. Okay. So how do we do this formal computation? When you do the formal computation, you need, you need to write for every fixed value in the sum, and there are two to the t possibilities, for every fixed value in the sum, you need to write down this polynomial. And then you need to sum them together. But the thing is that, um, in fact, what is going to dominate this computation is the number of monomials that can appear in there. And remember, before we had n variable, so we had all monomials of degree something in n variables, that was a lot. Here we have monomial of degree, uh, what is the bound on the degree we have for P? It's a product of L polynomials of degree D, so the degree is LD, but the number of variable is N minus T instead of N. Okay, so it turns out that the cost of building Q, which is this number of polynomial, is lower, you, you gain something because you removed uh, some variable. And then there is an exhaustive search part. And if you balance the cost of the two things and carefully do the analysis, which I clearly don't want to do here, I just wanted to, to show the main ideas. But if you do that, you get a complexity which is basically zero, uh, two to the 0 0.8 time n. With, with the follow-up imp improvement I mentioned from this, uh, this, this paper. But, but this, is, uh, this is clear much better than exhaustive search. So there is a way which is asymptotically better than exhaustive search, which you can prove. I didn't do all the proofs, but you can really prove that approach uh, with probabilistic polynomial. Uh, as far as I know, it has not been implemented. So it might be interesting if some people try to implement this approach to see what how it works and what happens. Maybe it would give something nice, but, uh, but as far as I know, it has not been done yet. And, um, but at least asymptotically, it's a very clean, very nice. Uh, so, so it's, and it's very recent. So these, these, uh, these problems are, are, still, uh, are still some very active things. And, uh, and I would be glad if more people were looking at this, uh, this polynomial system, which are very relevant for us. Okay. So now I want to go into something which is a little bit more classical and which has been around for, for edges, at least for the Grobner basis technique. Uh, what is called linearization was uh, appeared in the crypto literature, uh, let's say around 2000, a little bit before, I guess. And um, so, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to show you a very simple example. So, and in this simple example, I'm going to assume that I have a, a quadratic system, so degree two system, but for some reason, I have tons of equations. Okay, so basically I'm going to assume that the number of equation n is bigger than n times n plus one over n. Okay, there is, I need to do a technical assumption about this equation, but we will see later. So now, if there are so many equations, there is a very nice trick called linearization that allows you to solve the system very efficiently. So what do you do? Instead of, of looking at this as a, a system of polynomials, you say, okay, I have this product x i x j. Let's assume that they are independent variable. All of them are just independent variables. So you have every x i is a variable and this is an independent variable. Okay, now when you look at your system in this context, it just becomes a linear system because everything that appears in a polynomial of degree two is either X, a single linear, a single variable or a product of two, which I now view as an independent variable. So now I have a system of N equations and the number of variable, if you just count, there are N isolated one and N times N minus one 
pairs, product over two products. And if you just add the two, you get n n plus one over two variables in the linear system. So now if n is bigger than n n plus one over two, it's very likely that this system will not have many solutions. This system as a linear system is not going to have many solutions. And if it has many solutions, it means that your linear, your, your, your equation, the one you started from, were linearly dependent. So of course, if I give you 10 equations between, uh, between some variable, you can always, always build new equation by just taking sums of these. But they are not linearly independent, they are not interesting. But if you, have, if you are given equation which are linearly independent, then linearization is going to solve the system. So what you do is you just solve this linear system, which is kind of quick, and then you check whether the nonlinear constraint that xi xg is equal to xi times xg, you check that these const constraints are true. If they are not, you, you say, okay, this is a bad solution, I throw it away. And if everything is good, you have a solution of the, of the original system. Okay, that's it. So now the question, once you know about linearization, it's really tempting to ask, well, can we do something similar without having so many extra equations? If you just have a regular system where the number of, of solutions compares to the number of variables, can you do something? Oops. And this question was asked on the, in the crypto literature and an extension of this technique was proposed by Shami and Kipnis in 1999. Um, I'm going to try to explain in a nutshell the idea, but we will revisit it in a different context later. So basically the idea is, okay, you have equation. Now, if you just multiply them by, by variables or by product of variables, so in general by monomials. So let's say I take F1 and I multiply it by X1, X2 or by X1, X4 or by whatever. If I do that, I get many more equations. Okay. And if you look at it, it seems that the number of equations you get grows faster than the number of, of variables you are introducing. So it seems that if you do that, at some point, linearization should work. That's the basic idea of extended linear, uh, linearization. And if you do that, well, you just go to a dimension where you have more equations than unknown. You try to solve the system and you see whether it works or not. Okay. There's a question on Zulip. Does oh. the idea of linearization also apply to a system with higher degree? Uh, so uh, anything? Yes, it also applies, but, uh, but but if you are in degree three, you need something like n cube equation to make it work. The, the higher the degree, the more, the, the more products you have, so the more independent variable you need to make, but you just need more equation, but it, it still works. And in fact, when you look at extended linearization, it's going to higher degrees. So, so it's precisely because it works in higher degrees that extended linearization has a chance to work. Okay. And when you look at this, in fact, and I'm going to present it that way, you can see that it is basically a rediscovery of a method that was invented by Lazar in, uh, in 93, uh, which is a technique of computing Grodner basis by doing linear algebra on something which is called Macaulay's matrix. And we will see what Macaulay matrix is, and we will see it's very, very similar to linearization. Okay, in fact, since we are in the Boolean case, uh, we are going to use the field equation implicitly all the time. So whenever you multiply a polynomial by a monomial, you remember that x1 square is just x1, that x1 cube is just x1. And this is very useful because you, you get fewer monomials if you do that, and fewer variables. Okay, so one difficulty, and I think I hinted at it already, is to predict the size of the matrix you get. When is the matrix going to be big enough that the system will only contain the solution you look for? And it is very tricky because when you just multiply things 
by all the monomial and build a big matrix, it seems that the number of variables grows uh, less quickly than the number of equations. But there is one problem is that you are introducing equations which are linearly dependent without realizing. And because of that, it's very hard to know when the system becomes uniquely, uh, uh, uniquely solvable. And uh, this, is, this is very tricky. And of, co but of course, people have worked on this. And there are very good heuristic esti estimates about the complexity of this approach, so about which size of matrix we need to take in order for this to work. And this is what I want to look at now. OK, so for this, I'm going to need a little bit of algebraic background, uh, but I'm going to do it in a, I'm trying to do it in a very lightweight way. So I hope it's not going to be too painful. OK, so when you have polynomials, F1, F2, up to Fm in, in any field, but we are mostly going to work over F2, uh, what we call the ideal generated by the polynomial is just the set of all the linear of all these linear combinations. So you take the polynomials f1, f2, fm, you multiply them by other polynomials, which I call mu1, mu2, mu m, and you do the sum. Okay, and you take all of the all of the possibilities. So one thing which is clear is that if you have a solution of the original system, it's also going to be a zero of every polynomial in the ideal. OK, so, so that's why working with this ideal makes sense, because the solution you look for is a 0 of every polynomial in there. Nice. Now, we need something which is more computational. So this was really the mathematical object. But you know, this object is infinite, because you can go to infinite degrees. So it's really huge. Well, with the field equation, it's only finite, but still, uh, it's still very big. Uh, so what we are going to do is we are going to define something which is called i d of the polynomials, which is the same form of sums. But instead of taking all sums, you limit the degrees of, of every term in the sum to at most big D. So let's say if uh, it means that if f1 is of degree 2, you can multiply to by it by any polynomial up to the degree d minus 2. If it's of degree 3, you multiply it by anything up to degree d minus 3. OK, and if you have f1 of degree 2, you multiply f1 by everything up to degree d minus 2. If f2 is of degree 3, by everything up to degree d minus 3, and etc. But you look at the degree of every summand, not at the global degree. OK. So these, these are the two objects I want. So they are pretty simple. Uh, but when you look at this, there is, you can see something. Of, of, it's clear that ID is a subset of I, just because we took some sum in a restricted form. That's clear. But something which might be surprising is that, in general, if you look at ID, it doesn't contain all the degree all the polynomial of degree d from i. There could be more extra polynomials. So where do they come from? They come from the, from the sums where some of the summons are of degree higher than d. But when you put them together, there is a, there is a, deg a degree a reduction. Some of the higher degree terms cancel, vanishes, and you go back to degree d. And we are missing these things. OK, so but there is something interesting is that when you when ID contain all the degree D polynomials, this is a very interesting property. Uh, it's uh, the property that at, um, OK, so uh, yeah, so sorry, when, when OK, so sorry, I, 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 I didn't explain correctly. So when this property occurs, so for some, pol some polynomials, f1 up to fn, it happens that this, proper this interesting property is going to be true. 
So for if F, F1 up to Fm satisfies some extra stuff, then ID is going to contain all the polynomial of the grid. This happens, and when it happens, we call F1 Fm a Grobner basis of the ID. Okay, so it might seem strange, but, uh, but it's something very important. And something in the, even more important is that there is some kind of, of converse, which is true. That is, that is that if ID for some big D contains all the degree D polynomial from I, then ID itself, which is a big set, uh, is in fact a Grobner basis for the ideal. Okay, when I say ID itself, uh, in fact, I mean that ID is, okay, you look at ID, it's clearly a vector space, so you just, take a basis of it as a vector as a vector space and this basis which is finite is a Grobner basis of course it's going to be big if d is large much bigger than the initial polynomials but it is going to be a Grobner basis and so it means that you only need to go to degree d and after that you are done everything is okay okay and what is interesting is that there is always a potentially large d but there is always a D that way. Okay, so, so it means that this, looking at this thing, at these uh, IDs, uh, is a way uh, to compute Grobner basis. It's a very simple way. It's, it's easier to, to, to understand how it works. And if you look at, at Boberger algorithm or, or this kind of thing, it's just you just compute polynomial and you, you just, just look at the vector space that they generate. Okay. And what is Macaulay's matrix? It is simply the encoding of this ideal in a, in a, very, uh, in a very simple form. So what I, what I told you is that the ideal, well, the ID was just all the sum of the product. And then I told you, you can just, since it's a vector space, you can just take a basis of it. And it's easy to take a basis by just taking the set of the FIs multiplied by monomials because any polynomial is a sum of monomials. So this is the basis of the thing we, we want. Okay, well, I'm not, it's not true that it is a basis, but it's a generating set. Okay, and, when you, and what is called Macaulay's matrix is just a matrix that represents all this, this product of one monomial by a polynomial in the initial law. Uh, in the initial set. Okay, and I'm going to give an example to, to show you that it's something that is simple to, to look at. And this matrix is just going to be, uh, to, to be a matrix where the, the columns are indexed by the monomials that occur up to degree D, and the rows of the matrix are going to be indexed by these labels mu i f i. Okay. And now the interesting thing is that if you do linear algebra on this matrix, when d is large enough, you can get everything. Uh, if you do a, a row echelon form of this matrix, you get what is called a, a radius Grobner basis, which is a Grobner basis, but as small as you can make it, which is better than having a huge uh, set of polynomial. And if you just look at the, the solution of the linear system and check whether the extra constraints are, are satisfied, you just get all the solution of the original problem. And this, this thing here is exactly what, what extended linearization was about. Okay. And as I already said, uh, using field equation is going to help, the, to help the work. Okay, so now let's take a small example. And uh, so I took these three polynomials, X1, F1 is XY plus Y plus Z plus one, F2 is XZ plus X plus Z plus one, and F3 is YZ plus X plus one. And I'm going to build a matrix, the Macaulay matrix by going to degree three. So if I go to degree three, and you will note that with three variable, you can't go higher than that because of the field equation, but in general, we will not saturate the degree because it would be too big. Um, so if I go to degree three, I have my monomial one, X, Y, Z, X, Y, X, Z, Y, Z, and the products X, X, Y, Z. That's it. 
So these are going to be the columns of, of my Macaulay matrix. The rows, well, what do, we, what do I want to put in there? I want to put F1, F2, F3. And then I want to multiply them by monomials. So I'm going to put XF1, YF1, ZF1, XF2, YF2, ZF2, XF3, YF3, ZF3. Okay, and this is clearly uh, the I3 because since this polynomial have degree two, if I don't want to go higher than degree uh, two for every, than degree three, it seems natural to only multiply by stuff of degree uh, of degree one. Okay, here since the degree is saturating, I could multiply by other thing, but it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be uh, generic. Okay, so now in my matrix to make it more readable. I only I only wrote the ones. I didn't wrote the zeros. Okay, so every blank entry is just a zero. So there are some interesting lines. For example, if you look at the line XF2, you might see that it is completely zero. Look at the polynomial uh, F2 multiplied by X. What do you get? You get XZ and another time XZ. So mod two, this is zero. And here you have X square, but it's the same thing as X. And here you have X, so it's also going to zero. So this polynomial XF2 is just zero. And this is because F2 is just the product of X plus one by Z plus one. So if you multiply by X, you have an X square plus X as a factor, but we know that X square plus X is zero. So that's why the polynomial vanish. Okay, so this is my full Macaulay matrix. And now I'm going to do some linear algebra. And when I do the linear algebra, um, I, should get, uh, I should get what I want as I play. Okay, so typically first thing I do is I compute the kernel of this matrix mod two. And it turns out that the kernel only contains one non-zero vector, and this is it. And when you look at the, at the non-zero vector, it, its value at one is one, which is good because otherwise it couldn't encode anything, uh, anything reasonable. And, uh, and when you look at the other values, you find one at Z, zero at Y, and one at X. And you have other values here, but you can check that y times z is zero, that's fine because y was zero. xz is one, that's fine because we had one on one. xy is zero, that's normal. And the final one is zero, that's exactly what we wanted. So all the extra nonlinear constraints are satisfied. So this is a solution of the original system. Okay? So now we have a unique solution in the original system, which was just x1 equal one. Uh, sorry, x equal one, y equal zero, and z equal one. Good. Now you can do linear algebra this time in a dense way by computing an echelon for a row echelon form of the of the matrix. So just you know, you just take linear combination of the rows and you get this thing. And if you get this thing, you know that every polynomial I, I am writing here will be a polynomial in the ideal. So the solution is going to be a solution of all of these polynomials. And in particular, we have these linear polynomials here, which are going to form a Grobner basis of the system. And if I read them off the matrix, I have x plus one, y, and z plus one. And again, this means the same thing. This encodes the same solution. Okay, but, but in general, uh, from the Grobner basis, you get more than just from the kernel. So it's it's, uh, it's interesting to know about, about both, okay? And if you look at what linearization was about, you see that this is really the extended linearization uh, in, a very, uh, in a very simple way. Okay. Um, since this is really the, the, the most important uh, chunk of the lecture, are there any specific question about this? No? 
Okay, if it was clear for everyone, I'm, I'm happy. If everyone is lost, uh, too bad. I hope it's not the case. Okay, so now the difficulty, as I told you, is to predict the degree. Where do you want, where do you need to go to, to solve the system? And this has been studied by, uh, in, in Magalis Barde PhD thesis, and she had to make some heuristic assumption. Why do you need that? Because if I give you an arbitrary system of, of, of equation, um, it might be trapdoored in some way. I tell, okay, I give you seven equations, but when you look at them, you realize, oh, equation number seven is in fact the sum of the first three. So if I do that, I'm cheating. I just gave you one fake equation that didn't belong here because it was already a combination of the others. And it, the thing can be worse because I could be hiding dependencies at, degree, at the next degrees and you wouldn't realize immediately, but it would really change the behavior of the thing. So, so in order to know to which degree you, you are going to go, you basically need to assume that uh, your polynomial are more or less independent, except that they have this, this shared solution. So it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit tricky, but, uh, but in particular, if you do it uh, in the crypto way where you fix a solution and then you pick random polynomials of degree two and just adjust the constant term to make sure that the original solution is a solution of that, then you will be in this very generic case and you can, uh, you, you can apply the, uh, the result of, uh, of Barbe's things. And what she says is that, okay, basically, if you are taking quadratic polynomials and if the number of polynomials is equal to the number of variables, then you only need to go to a quite low degree, which is 0 0.09 times n. So let's say n over 11 or something like this. Okay, so the degree you need to go to is much lower than uh, what, you would, what you would go to if you saturated everything. That would be n. Okay, and, and when you look at the complexity, what you have to do is you have to look at what is going to be the size of the matrix. Okay, and this size is going to be a binomial of, of 0.09 n in n. Okay, which is 0 0.4 something. And when you look at the complexity, assuming that you do a quadratic algorithm, uh, you get this complexity of two to the 0 0.873 times n, which is also better than exhaustive search. Okay, so Grobner bases are beating exhaustive search, uh, even in the case where n, n is equal to n, well, asymptotically, because uh, in practice, uh, the fast exhaustive search of Bouillard is much faster than, than what, I, what I described. Okay, but what is interesting is that if you increase the number of equation to uh, alpha times m, uh, to, uh, sorry, to n equal alpha times n, there is a typo here, um, with alpha bigger than one, then the degree, uh, this thing which is called the degree of regularity in, in, most, uh, in most papers, this thing is going to decrease and it's going to take this value. Okay, it's not clear what this value is, but it's kind of useful to have the, to have the formula somewhere. And, uh, and it decreases quite quickly. So it means that if you add extra equations, then you can, uh, you can solve the, the thing much, much faster than if you only have uh, the initial numbers assuming that the, these extra equations are independent from the other in some, uh, in some kind of strong sense. Okay, so, so this is another way to go faster than, uh, than exhaustive search. But okay, you might tell me, well, this method is worse than the probabilistic polynomial, the complexity is, is bigger. But in fact, yeah, in fact, you can do better um, by doing something I'm going to describe now. Uh, which, which is an hybrid method. So this, uh, the first of the hybrid method is something called Boolean solve, which was uh, proposed by Bar uh, Bardet, Fauger, Salvi, and Spinelower. And basically it combines some exhaustive search with Grobner basis to get something which is faster than both. And what you do is the following. 
you, um, you basically take half of the variables and you enumerate all the values for these variables. Once you, once you have done the, once you have instantiated this, this variable, uh, you run the Grobner basis algorithm, but you run it on a system with fewer variables without having reduced the number of equations. So it's overdetermined now. So it's faster. And, uh, and, and this trade-off is such that you get, uh, you get a complexity which is even better than, uh, than the complexity we had, uh, uh, we had for probabilistic polynomials. And, and the complexity improves if you increase the number of equations, which we didn't get for probabilistic polynomials. So it's something nice. And it's, it's asymptotically uh, the fastest me method we know currently. So it's heuristic, but it's, uh, I think it's asymptotically the fastest thing. Uh, there is another way to do the hybrid thing. Yeah. There's a question on Zulip. Uh, how about degree D for underdetermined systems? Oh, um, for underdetermined systems, they, they, they are not of dimensions. Well, well, they are kind of of dimension zero because we have the field equations. Um, but okay, the thing is that for underdetermined system, uh, what you usually do to solve them is not do directly uh, a Grobner basis because you you would run into uh, into problem of having uh, uh, of having two huge Grobner basis. What you do instead, if they are underdetermined, that you can randomly fix some of the variables and get a system which is ordinary and, and you solve this one. So if you want, if you want a single solution, if you don't want the set of all solutions, it's the way to go. And, uh, and typically uh, for, signature, for signature schemes, which are multivariate, usually you have underdetermined system so, you, so that you can have many different signatures for the same thing. And, uh, and because, uh, because of that, you just use this approach. And also, I'm not going to describe it, but if you go for systems which are massively underdetermined, where you have really uh, a very small number of variables on tons of, uh, uh, sorry, a very small number of equations on tons of variables, then you can do some linear tricks by manipulating the equations uh, to solve them faster. But I didn't, uh, I didn't want to go into that. And there's another question on here. Uh, yeah. Does the bound for D, given alpha and the strong assumptions on slide 38, agree with the experience reported by Shamir and Kipnis that when the number of quadratic equations is 0 0.1 times n squared, the extended linearization will work? Well, I don't remember the, what they had in the experiences at the time, but uh, okay, but we should remember that this is, uh, this is asymptotic. Uh, they are missing terms, so it's it's for large variable. Uh, it's not exact for small values of n, but but if you look at the exact formulas, uh, which predict the rank of the systems, uh, and you pick random systems, the ranks are really the one which are which are explained by this technique. So so they must agree with whatever was 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 found when you you concretely looked at the rank unless the systems that were chosen were not random. If they had some extra structure, then, uh, then things are different. So typically, uh, if we look at the HFE system I described before, uh, what is happening is if you try to run Grobner basis uh, algorithm on HFE system, you will see that D is much smaller than expected. And this is because of the travel. So, so this is only true for random, uh, randomly chosen uh, systems. If you have system with extra structure, uh, it might be much faster. Okay. So the other approach, which was something we introduced with, uh, with Vanessa Witz uh, in 2017 also, um, is basically you are going to do the, the linear algebra in the Macaulay matrix in a different way. You are going to split the variable in two sets and you are going to look for polynomials which are linear in care of the variable and you don't care about the degree in the others. 
Okay, and then once you have these polynomials, you, you need to get more than k of them. You use the exhaustive search approach to evaluate them in all the other variables. You get a linear system in the remaining k and you solve this system. And if you do that, uh, you get the solution again. But what is interesting is that this is something which is using which, which uses the Macaulay matrix or some kind of, of linear of uh, extended linearization, but it beats exhaustive search in practice, even for as little as 40 variables, even if the system is not overdetermined. So it's really interesting because people thought that the, the crossover point was very far for at least 150 variables, maybe 200, uh, nobody knows exactly. But it turns out that by, by playing with that, you can make it practical and you, make, you can make it beat exhaustive search. Okay, um, there is a final uh, approach to solve, uh, to solve these things that I, I'm not going to go in much into the detail, but I wanted to mention it. Uh, there is a way to solve uh, polynomial system of equation by using what are called SAT solvers. So SAT solvers are uh, uh, programs that, that solve a satisfiability problem where you basically have, uh, so these are kind of Boolean equation, but of, of a very specific form. So you are, they are Boolean equation that tells you that you have triples of variable and these triples, these triple of, uh, so they are logical ors of variable of three things. And this, this triple are all going to be true for correct assignment of the variable. And the things that may occur in a triple are either variable or negative variable. So what you are saying is that, okay, maybe A, B, maybe the A or B or C is true, or you could also say, okay, I want A and not B and C, oh, sorry, B or not B or, uh, or C to be true. And uh, these are the, the clauses you get in the, and you input to the SAT solver. And it turns out uh, that this is universal and you can encode uh, evaluation of polynomial into SAT uh, problem, uh, but you, had to, uh, you have to add extra variables. And as far as I know, this was proposed by Gregory Bard. He has a paper which is not published as far as I know uh, on his web page. And it's implemented in Magma. Uh, using some SAT solver, which is called MiniSAT. And it turns out that for sparse polynomial, it is much faster than any Grobner basis or exhaustive search technique. So um, I'm not aware of a very precise analysis of how that work and what the complexity would be, because even the SAT solver, uh, it's hard to know and to predict how they work because they, they really depend a lot on the, on the systems they are solving. But it's very interesting to see that in some cryptographic relevant example, it can beat the other, the other approaches, despite the fact that in Magma, the Grobner basis is really implemented in a fast way. So it's, um, it's another last approach that I wanted to mention uh, about, this, uh, about this solving of, uh, of, of polynomial equation of the, over the Booleans. And uh, basically that's all I wanted to say, but I am uh, ready to answer questions uh, if, there are, if there are any more. Sorry, my internet froze for a second.